so firstly, thank you, um, as usual, for those who have come to many free speech uh, champions events and those um, who are new, thank you so much for joining us. And Free Speech Champions is a project which aims to inspire young people in particular um, to open inquiry, the free exchange of ideas and engaging with the big questions and big ideas shaping the public conversation and really equipping young people with the tools to navigate the world and make the case for free expression and free speech in ways that make sense to people and resonate with people today in their generation. And so this event, as it says, is sex and censorship in the 20th century. And it's a bit different from some of our usual events. Usually we're very much focused on the free speech implications of um, whether that's journalism or, or um, artistic freedom and all of the different events that we've done. But this question seems to be coming up more and more um, in, in the mainstream media, in the public conversation from discussions on, on, on about campus or universities providing resources for, for students um, that are involved in different forms of sex work um, to almost a, a kind of backlash brewing amongst uh, radical feminists and other groups around the impact of the sexual revolution. And so we really want to look at what sexual freedom means today. You know, what, what does it mean to be sexually free? Is the, what's the, is the ubiquity of porn a, a sign of a liberated society or, or of moral decay? And did um, the ecstatic sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s onwards really achieve its goals? Or did it produce new doubts and new anxieties that many today are experiencing and having to navigate? So these are some of the questions that we want to explore. It's a very big discussion. And that's why we are joined by some fantastic speakers who come from a whole range of um, perspectives and insights to hopefully throughout this hour and a half tease out um, all of these nuances and issues, or at least many of them. So before I um, introduce the panel, I'll just do a run through as usual about some of the- well, I'll just run through as usual about some of the- so firstly, can everyone make sure that they mute themselves so that we don't have any uh, sound coming in and, and things like that. But also, please, could you keep your video on if you um, don't mind? We like to see all the different people that are at our events. And it's just great to, even in the digital world, create a sense of community and a sense of space um, when we kind of interact with one another. But also consider donating to the project. It is one on, on donations and that's how we keep the project alive and keep the conversations and campaigning that we do um, alive in all parts of the country, but also in different parts of the world as well. And in just in terms of the format of the event, um, we will have a few minutes kind of provocations and, and perspectives and openings from the um, different panelists. And then we'll discuss myself and the panelists for another kind of 15 to 20 minutes and then for the last half an hour, uh, we will open it to the floor. So ask lots and lots of questions and let's really try and um, understand the question of freedom and sexual freedom in the present day. So with no uh, further ado, I will introduce uh, my amazing panelists in no particular order. We have um, Raven Connolly. She is a philosopher and facilitator at the STOA. This is a really great um, group and uh, it, in the digital space, having really interesting and fascinating um, conversations about kind of spirituality and, and all of these interesting things that are shaping the public conversation. Also, uh, Jerry Barnett, he is a campaigner and author of Porn Panic, um, Sex and Censorship in the UK. So very kind of on the nose in relation to the subject we're talking about. Um, Candice Horback, and she is a lifestyle YouTuber and blogger and has discussed on her YouTube channel many of the um, things that we're going to be touching upon today. And also Megan Murphy, and she is a journalist um, and founder of Feminist current so very interesting coming from many different perspectives and I guess firstly it would be great to hear from you uh, Jerry as someone who has written uh, directly on this subject it would be good to just have um, a few minutes of your uh, first reaction to this subject found the unmute button um, hi everyone my name's Jerry Barnett. Um, by background, I'm a software technologist. Um, but in, around the mid-90s, I set up a, a software business to focus on this new technology that had turned up called the World Wide Web. And um, 
I found myself getting involved in quite a, a few different types of business, but in particular, um, the, the rise of pornography, which kind of took me and took everyone by surprise. And, and it, at least in the 1990s, it, it really took over the internet and it became, it, it was the dominant thing on the internet in, in those early few years of the World Wide Web. So um, I'd always been a political activist by background. I've been involved in anti-racism and, and anti-apartheid and the kind of things that were fashionable in the 80s and 90s. And I began to become interested in sexual politics and, and sexual freedom issues. And this was driven by a number of things. But the first thing I did when I, I got involved with this industry to find, was to find out who are the people that work in it? Why do they work in it? What kinds of people are they? And are any of these terrible rumors um, and you hear about the industry true? You know, um, are, what makes women work in, in, in an industry like this? And are they really being coerced? And, uh, and are they being subject to terrible things? And, and this kind of thing, which the, these stories have always been around. So I, I began to get very involved. Began to got to know pretty much everyone in the industry in the early 2000s. Um, because it's in the UK, at least, it's a small industry over here, and it's kind of a lot more, a, a lot smaller and friendlier, and more of a cottage industry than in the US, where it, it, it's always been a much bigger business. Um, and bit by bit, I began to, to learn things that kind of disturbed me. The first thing that I, I began to, to realize as I got to know a lot of performers, especially, was that there was a right, this rising kind of campaign of abuse and harassment against porn performers, strippers, sex workers. Um, and some of this was coming from the usual suspects from kind of religious quarters and that kind of thing. But I found that there were these small kind of quite radical feminist groups, radical, radical feminist groups um, around at the time. And I, I found them, I, I had friends who had literally been subject to threats, harassment, um, they get received phone calls on the way to do private strip shows to, to say, we know where you're going, we know where you're, what your address is, turn around um, or, or else kind of thing. Um, and that kind of all threw me and took me aback of this and got started to get me involved in, in the politics of, of sexual freedom. Um, and as a kind of leftish person myself, I was quite surprised that this stuff was coming from the left and from sections of the feminist movement. So I set out to understand the history of that and I, I in, ended up writing a book called Porn Panic which looks at it was, well it really looked at the, the kind of the last decade or so of anti-sex feminist activism mostly in the UK and, and I documented the behavior of groups like Object and UK Feminista um, that were very viciously anti-sex work and anti-sex worker that claimed to be on the side of the sex workers and claim to be trying to rescue them from abuse and, and so on, but actually were, were quite horrible to them and, and refused to, to speak to them. Um, and all this interested me. So I dug back into the history of anti-sex feminism, back to Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin, who kind of started the whole thing in the late 70s. And I wrote Porn Panic about really about where this very censorious authoritarian kind of strand had come from. And then I began to get interested in how identity politics more in general was, was leading to censorship. So I began to get interested in not just in the way the feminists were doing it, but the way um, the left was censoring things based on race and so on. So I, my book ended up being a, a book about the early days of cancel culture. It was really written in 19, uh, in, 19, in 2014, 15. So, it doesn't talk about things. It doesn't have the words woke or cancel culture or anything in it, but it, it certainly, it, it talked about the, those early movements towards censorious kind of authoritarian behavior on the left and identified them very much as being rooted in radical feminism. Um, so I've got my book, Porn Panic, which I've just plugged. I've also written, there's a one chapter version available as a Kindle as an ebook only on Amazon called Porn, What's the Harm? And that's literally one chapter from my book, Porn Panic. Um, and it's the, it's the chapter that just deals with the evidence related to pornography and harm. And one of the things I've found 
is that a lot, I met a lot of radical, radical feminists at university debates and media debates and so on. I found that even though they were claiming harm, they couldn't, they, they, they had no evidence for it. I was literally waiting for them to feed me the evidence that I could then review and examine. And they didn't have evidence to back their claims. It was very much based around these kind of hysterical claims about harm to women, harm to children, but I, I couldn't find the meat in these claims. So I went and, and looked at the evidence and research myself. Um, but yeah, my position broadly is that sexual freedom and sexual expression are incredibly important to human society, and it's important that, that they're kept free. If people oppose them, then the onus is on them to make the case that these things are harmful. It's not the onus isn't on us to disprove their claims that they provide without, without evidence. Um, and yeah, I, so I know a fair bit about pornography and the research around it. Um, which may, maybe we'll come back to, to later, but in particular, the evidence around sexual violence and the links there and so on. But um, I've probably talked long enough now, I think. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Candice, what are your uh, opening thoughts and um, picking up on either the, the, the blurb or even anything that, that Jerry said? What, what's your opening thoughts? Hi, everybody. So um, I come from the adult space. That's probably where I'm actually more widely known. So I was in the adult industry for over a decade. Um, then I started the podcast with everyone else during the pandemic. So I've had a podcast going for a little over a year now. I think when it comes to sexual freedom, it's one of those things that you have to accept a certain amount of responsibility with it, just like any other freedom, but you have to ask yourself when it comes to government censorship, because that's kind of what the opposition is talking about, is how much government do you want, and then how well has prohibition worked, and how well has abolishing things that we don't like work, so you have to kind of understand like what's not for you what's not for your family and what's not for your morals and then what's not for everybody else. So it's kind of finding that boundary of letting people have the right to be their authentic self and um, not saying it's without criticism and not without responsibility, but um, just the right to exist. Oh, I don't have your audio. Oh, thank you. And, and Megan, what do you, um, what are your opening thoughts? Hey, sorry. Um, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, when we're talking about the sex industry and free speech, I sort of find that framing <clears throat> misrepresentative and I've never totally understood it because of course, you know, pornography and prostitution aren't speech and, and pornography um, constitutes really filmed prostitution. And I am a free speech advocate and I don't, I'm not pro censorship. So it is a challenging conversation to have. And I certainly understand that there's nuance. I do understand that um, there are people in the industry that are consenting, of course, and that, you know, maybe enjoy doing this kind of work. But I do also know that, you know, hundreds of thousands of women who are in prostitution and in pornography are being exploited, have been trafficked, are abused, you know, are not in a position to consent necessarily. And beyond that, you know, I have concerns. I have concerns about how women are treated in the industry, but I also have concerns about the impact of, you know, imagery that's imagery and language as well, of course, that is super misogynist, super racist, super dehumanizing, super degrading to women. Um, and that these images and videos are being produced and shared for profit. So to me, it's one thing to do whatever you wanna do in your own bedroom, I fully support that. But when you're producing a product and you're selling it, um, I think that's different. And I do find it, I'm not in favor of hate speech laws at all. I don't think there should be any hate speech laws. Um, but I do wonder why um, countries that have hate speech laws don't apply those laws to pornography because we're, what we're seeing and what we're, the kind of language that we hear in pornography very obviously to me constitutes hate speech. And I always wonder why 
pornography kind of gets to fly under the radar. You know, in Canada, for example, and in other countries as well, you can't actually consent to abuse. You can't consent to sexual abuse. Um, if a woman's in a situation of domestic violence, it doesn't become okay or not illegal because she consents, because she decides to stay. So if what we're seeing in pornography, and I'm not saying all pornography is this, but there certainly is pornography that is this. If what we're seeing in pornography does constitute sexual abuse, sexual violence, um, any kind of violence, any kind of abuse, the consent argument, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't apply there. Um, so, and you know, I, I, I find like, the comments around radical feminists going after sex workers, I mean, I would like to see evidence for that because I've been involved with, I don't identify as a radical feminist personally, but I've been involved in radical feminist feminism and engaged with radical feminists for a very long time, many of whom do work against exploitation and abuse in the sex trade, and none of them would ever go after a prostituted woman or a woman in porn. They tend to go after brothel owners, traffickers, pimps, men who produce porn, men who exploit women. And of course there's conflicts. There's conflicts between radical feminists and women who promote sex as work and prostitution as a job like any other. You know, there's a political conflict there. But as somebody who's been involved in this debate for a very long time, I'll tell you that I, I've not been treated very well by people who are part of the sex work lobby and they've attempted to censor and cancel me, ironically, many, many times. You know, there's a petition to have me fired from my job because of my arguments against prostitution and pornography. And I'm not going to say that, you know, I have a lot of problems with radical feminism and radical feminists, and um, they're certainly not all perfect, kind beings, but... Um, and I do know that in my work, any, in any case, it's not been that those kinds of people are targeting women in prostitution and porn, but rather they, they try to work against the industry. Um, thank you, Megan. And Raven, what your opening thoughts? Yeah, um, I'm extremely uh, grateful and excited to have this conversation. For me personally, pornography has been a very complex topic to try and get into. Um, and as I've been thinking about it after being invited to this panel, um, a lot of the things that I was coming up with as kind of my feelings of um, kind of criticism of the pornography industry were things that I actually found to be structural issues in other industries uh, in, in, in our society, that pornography actually happens to be kind of the most explicit or kind of the most controversial way of talking about those issues. So the way that I've been thinking about this is um, in terms of advertising and like the kind of use of sexual imagery in order to sell products uh, is, is basically ubiquitous within our society. And so the arguments about the objectification of women um, coming solely out of the pornography industry, I think is a misrepresentation of actually the way in which we view that women in society if that's the argument, right? If the argument is the issue with the objectification of women, I think that we could talk about advertising writ large and the fact that, you know, since the beginning of the advertising industry, we've known that sex sells. The association of a woman with a cigarette is, you know, has a kind of, you know, Freudian phallic uh, association. So um, this has been part of how products have been sold since the beginning uh, of advertising. And I think that, um, advertising itself and its connection to pornography is interesting to me. A lot of the women that, um, you know, I know and I follow who are very, you know, popular on OnlyFans, um, like Ayla Girl, for example, she's like a brilliant advertiser. Like so much of what, what these women are doing is doing like brilliant business and advertising because that's basically what the industry is, right? It's, it's drawing attention to yourself. And in a sense, within the context of, of using sex to sell things, in a way, pornography is the most kind of explicit, right? It's sex selling sex rather than sex selling consumer goods. So I think that that's a kind of interesting like way of reframing the conversation is that pornography itself is kind of the most concentrated example of what is a broader thing within our society, which is attention grabbing, using shock tactics, 
using forms of manipulation, using forms of sensory overload or sensory shock in order to basically gather um, attention and capture the limbic systems of people who are consuming or being exposed to certain kinds of images and environments. Um, and this happens everywhere. This is in our architecture. This is in when we're watching television, when we're watching films, and it's also when we go online. And because of the porosity of our online environments and the fact that things are not contained very easily, basically, no matter what, like you could be on a Twitter feed and be shocked by a protest video where someone's getting shot against your consent, right? Or you could end up with, an, with a lewd image in your feed that's against your consent. So I think pornography is a kind of point um, of where we get to kind of talk about a lot of these things, but it's often not seen as like an example of greater issues that we actually are finding with many other forms of, I guess, attention, the attention economy and how basically our, our sovereignty over the things that we're being exposed to as people um, is basically being uh, captured by other entities. Uh, so that's a way that I've been thinking about this. Um, I think another thing, an, another interesting way of talking about pornography is basically the virtualization of pornography. So what happens when we remove women from the picture? When we're no longer talking about the harm of people and we're only dealing with the imagery, we're only dealing with people consuming pornographic imagery and that's basically AI produced or produced by, by bots. How does the conversation change? Because that's where things are going um, and, the, and the pornography pornography industry is investing a lot of money in the virtualization of porn, the creation of, you know, girlfriend experience, uh, AI bots that produce the production of sex robots um, and other types of, of tools for masturbation that represent the images of women. So how does our conversation change, right? When this is the framing of it, when we're not talking about the exploitation of women um, and the harm on women, uh, or the harm on uh, you know people in the, kind of in the adjacent industries like sex trafficking, we're just talking about the imagery and the impact of the imagery in society. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I think that that's an interesting reframing as well, and I think our moral intuitions might change because we might still find it to be a social ill. We still may find it to be something that we want to have contained, but it's not. The arguments can't be based in protecting women or harm um, in terms of people in the industry. So that's another reframing that I think is is interesting for trying to get into this conversation. Thank you so much, Raven. Really fascinating opening uh, provocations and, and insights from everyone. I think I was gonna start with you, Megan. I mean, cause I, I think kind of picking up slightly on what Raven said and, and what Candace said and trying to tease out maybe the free speech uh, questions in there. I mean, how, how do, do, do you see um, pornographic imagery um, as fundamentally different as, for example, when you might watch a film and you see kind of simulated um, or, or, or performed acts of violence. You know, we, we know that they're performers and, and they are kind of um, engaging in some kind of drama, a, a performance so that they've consented to it. Now the imagery, it, you know, they're, they're replicating something that we might find, you know, wrong in real life, but we recognize that it is a, um, performance as such. So do, do you do you have a problem? Do, do you see any fundamental difference between when you go to a cinema and you see people being violent towards one another versus, um, a, you know, a woman simulating a sex act, uh, acting for, for a kind of pornographic film? Do you see any difference there, Megan? Well, in pornography, those women aren't simulating sex acts. You know, those acts that are happening in pornography really are happening. Um, they really but are even, even even so even so even they're they're performing essentially well no not really i mean they are performing and that they're pretending that they're enjoying themselves and they're not actually enjoying themselves but <laughs> but you know those those acts you know if if we're talking about pornography that is violent or that simulate sexual abuse. I mean, those acts really are happening to those women. And, you know, I do, and I see it as a promotion of those acts. It's sexualizing those acts. So it's, you know, essentially, I think that when we're watching these things and we're masturbating to these things, we're rewiring our brains and sexualities to be turned on by these acts. So often, as I understand it, you know, a lot of 
boys who start watching porn and boys do watch start start watching porn very young some girls do too you know porn is is essentially impossible to avoid nowadays um if you're online you're gonna see pornography and you know i've and i've talked to a lot of men in real life that this has happened to where they sort of start to get bored of the the regular more vanilla you could call it porn and then they start seeking out more extreme pornography um and i know men who have been impacted that by that personally in their sex lives who you know stop being able to be turned on by just regular sex because they start to have fetishized these more extreme acts and so to me you know the conversation again like i don't i can't support censorship but i can say that we should be having a conversation about what's ethical and what's not ethical and about making choices in our personal lives about what we consume and how that impacts us and how that impacts the people in our lives how that impacts the way we see and relate to other people how it impacts our relationships you know how it impacts the way that men view and treat women um, there's lots of different conversations that we can have here and I find I'm glad that we're having this conversation because I do find that often this is this comes down to this binary or this black and white conversation that 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 isn't representative um, wherein we're talking about you know ban all pornography or don't ban all pornography and is all pornography abusive or is all pornography you know free speech. And, and it's not about any of those things. It's about trying to make ethical choices. I mean, I think it's good to bring up the fact that objectification, of course, objectification doesn't just happen in porn. It happens all over the place. I mean, when I say porn is everywhere, I'm not even just talking about literal porn. I'm talking about the pornified images that are all over Instagram, you know, that women are promoting in, in terms of trying to build a following um, trying to be influencers, so on and so forth, in advertising, of course, in the media. And it's, you know, you can say, okay, these women are great business women. Like, who cares? Like, I'm talking about ethics and I'm talking about impact and I'm talking about society and I'm talking about people. I don't give a shit if you're a good business person. You can be a good business person and run a brothel. That's a really good business idea. <laughs> you're for sure going to make a lot of money. But I want to talk about what, whether what you're doing is, is ethical and, and, you know, whether or not it perpetrates harm or impacts people in a, in a negative or impacts society in a negative way. And, and Jerry, I mean, it isn't the crux of this, you know, a question of morality and, and kind of, you know, your moral orientation, because you, you and Megan can kind of put forward evidence here and evidence there and this scientific research says this and this scientific research says that and you can debate you know to the cows come home but ultimately isn't it a question of a kind of fundamental difference in you know what you constitute as a kind of moral um, worldview or moral society and, and do you think that we should start to kind of talk about these issues in more moral terms rather than, you know, a, a kind of scientific conversation about what constitutes harm and, and what evidence says this or that? Um, I think people are welcome to talk about morality and, and so on, but I think the, the first thing is to deal with the evidence and to decide whether it's harmful because most people will base their morality pretty much on whether something is, is harmful or not. And, you know, and you say that, you know, I give evidence for this and Megan gives evidence for that. I mean, actually, I've read some of Megan's stuff and she's quite, um, seems quite oblivious to research and evidence. She's, she talks about we need to look more at, um, you know, the effects on society, the effects on viewers and so on. But there's a vast amount of research going on into this now. There are entire journals dedicated to the study of pornography. And, but yeah, I, I think morality is a very important part of this to discuss but but you know morality people have different moralities and certainly my morality is based very much on whether people are being harmed and whether people are being coerced and if they're not then then it's pretty hard to to suggest that something is is immoral universally but but what about from a societal perspective so i think what's been touched upon is this sense of you know the 
the image we're promoting to young women about what is okay for them to be and to do you know does that set, is that the message we want to send so it's not one of the things that's come up in the news very recently is universities um, providing resources because increasingly a number of students are seeing sex work as an option for them in order to support themselves through university now you yeah. might think that's okay but is it could you understand why some people might say well regardless of anything realistically this is not the kind of society we want to live in where young women see that as you know a path that they should go down um i, I have complete respect for anyone who, who thinks that they they don't want to live in that kind of society but ultimately it's not up to them it's up to the individuals that are choosing to do this and again if it's not being coerced um, if there's not coercion involved, and if, if women, primarily women, sometimes men, are choosing sex work of their own accord, then it's very hard to find um, an argument against that. It's, it is interesting to look much more broadly at the wider effects on society of sexual freedom and the sexual revolution, including the availability of sex work, including the availability of pornography. And we should be looking at that and discussing that. But there isn't anything inherently wrong with with sex work or pornography as long as everybody involved is a, is a consenting adult um and yeah i mean porn has seems to have a huge effect on society and, and society is changing um very much as a result of of sexual freedom in mostly in good ways but sometimes in ways that make people feel uncomfortable including me and you know one of those is increasing number of, of younger people who can't find relationships and, and that's something i'm interested in making a documentary about at the moment um and i think that's possibly sad and possibly negative but there's the fact is it still comes about as a result of young people making different life choices and structuring their lives differently and on the other side there are huge benefits about not force telling women girls that they have to to have a ring on their finger by the age of 20 um, or not telling or not stigmatizing girls who who enjoy casual sex, not stigmatizing women who get pregnant out of wedlock and so on. All of those things are, are beneficial and they're the other side of the same coin, really. Um, and, and Candice, I mean, how much weight do you place on this subject of question of bodily autonomy? Because that's been a very kind of powerful argument um, countering the 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 criticisms coming from various different uh, groups that actually ultimately a woman has the faculties to be able to think for herself and come to the decision she wants to about her body and regardless of questions of morality or or um, all the different arguments people put forward that ultimately what's fundamental for a, a free society is people being able to make decisions about what they want to do with their body is that an argument that you see as being really compelling I think so to an extent. I think um, nothing in life is without consequence, right? So I understand the perspective of trying to protect these young women that are making this life altering decision that is going to implode your life before. I mean, I I talk about this a lot actually with my husband, and he, especially in times that um, like something negatively comes up because of my career. and. I'm so fortunate in the sense that I'm the exception as far as, you know, having a, a successful career, having an overall great experience within the industry um, and having the longevity that I've had. And it's still really difficult to deal with like the social fallout of my decisions. I can't imagine being on the side that a lot of people find themselves, which is I made this decision, it's on the internet forever. And now I still have all of these closed doors that I can't even break through if I wanted. So it's tough because, yeah, you can say consenting and I'm obviously like I'm pro making your own decision. I'm like freedom all of the way. And I think that with freedom comes again, responsibility and risk. Um, but it's their conversation needs to be had about having like what I like to call conscious consent, which is or informed consent, right? Like having some one and i don't know how you would do this because it's not like there's no mentorship programs there's no union there's no 
um, training before you go in. Anyone with an iPhone can make a camera, but it's like, do you, do you understand that by posting this, you know, you're going to alienate certain friends, certain families and uh, certain family members and certain opportunities. Um, so yeah, I think you should be able 100% to do what you want. If you want to start an OnlyFans page, if you want to get into the porn industry, um, if you want to get into prostitution, like I've talked to Ayla girl on my podcast and we're actually pretty good friends and she's had a great experience in that line of work. It's not for everyone. I don't think it's supposed to be for everyone, but I respect her decision to do that and for her to live the life that's going to make her feel happy, fulfilled and authentic. And that's might not be for me. That might not. That's probably not for the vast majority of women. Right. And that's OK. And I think when it comes down to sexual freedom, it's it's living in that authentic self and it's saying, sexual freedom is for me to do what with my body what is going to make me feel respected secure and happy and for you to do what's going to make you feel respected secure and, ha and happy and those things can be you know totally different and i don't have to agree with your choices and you don't have to agree with my choices but i think that we need to agree on the fun fundamental principle of the freedom to make that choice really interesting and and maven you you kind of touched upon you know whether or not this was really about the, the, the bodies and the way that they were treated or whether it's were if there was kind of technological changes um wherein there wasn't necessarily it wasn't embodied um that are we still worried about the impact that's having on on society and I think that kind of makes me wonder then you know are, is, is this a reflection this conversation becoming more and more mainstream a reflection of a broader um, conversation in society or a broader crisis in society wherein we're seeing porn as the 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 kind of microcosm of it so it might be you know um uh, uh, the collapse of kind of intimacy and 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 like relationships and it may be a sense of short-termism and, and maybe the porn industry is being scapegoated for what is a a, a deeper crisis or a broader crisis um in society what do you think uh, I mean, yeah, I, I would I would basically agree with that. I think that part of why people like to talk about porn is because it's explicit sex acts. <laughs> um, sex sells, right? Um, this is a real thing. Uh, it's shocking. It's engaging. It's interesting. It totally hijacks our limbic system. Um, and I think that it is a kind of concentration of lots of the uh, lots of the issues that have been pushed into the shadows. Um, that basically we don't know how to reason through. And I, I think that your point earlier about this being fundamentally an issue of morality is true. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's true because even having a harm orientation towards morality, having a freedom orientation towards morality, all of those are cultural contexts um, and are not necessarily fundamental moral principles. Uh, and we can see throughout human history that there have been lots of different attitudes towards sex and the expression of sexual acts in public. Um, you know, there's more pagan societies that you can go and see. There's, there's gods of, of phalluses and they're like worshiping penises. And, you know, there's explicit acts on painted on these urns, you know, you know, within human history, right? Like, so this is something that's like, there's a wide variation of how human beings have engaged with their sexual nature. Um, and also the, the issue of, um, of, of sexual difference of men and women. And I think that this is another one of these um, more kind of broad categories that uh, that we're basically contending with today is women have an ex like enormous amount of sexual power, enormous amount of sexual power, and they inherit this power when they are very young. And all of us go through developmental processes. We are not little little adult humans when we're five years old. We go through a developmental process. We, do, we actually become more realized and more like self-authoring human beings over the course of our lives. So there is an issue here when thinking about how we are socializing young people because we give them ideas about how they're going to be accepted and how they're going to gain attention and um, become someone of affluence or importance in, in society. Uh, so the ubiquity of porn or the ability to basically grab attention. And I think this is where, once again, we're talking about mediums we're talking about mediums of communication. Jerry brought up that the World Wide Web came on the scene and suddenly there was just this explosion of pornography. Um, and all, like also even today, like so much of the internet traffic is actually the, um, the consumption or the uh, creation of pornographic material. So I think part of this has to do with the digital age and the fact that it's so image mediated. 
Um, everything that we're interacting with online is in a sense an image, it's a depiction of another kind of, um, of, a, of, a, of a real person or like a simulated event. And so the fact that we're living in like a highly simulated environment and this is so image mediated, I think brings up larger questions about what we wanna be exposed to. You brought up the issue of violence. I mean, violence is another kind of thing that um, can be deeply traumatizing to come across a video of someone being killed in your newsfeed, right? That is like, I have had that happen to me before. I'm just scrolling and next thing you know, I'm watching somebody get murdered on the street, right? And I think that, th that these are bigger issues of like, what kind of sovereignty do we have over the things that we're exposed to and the fact that our attention is being harvested and shock is being used to basically keep us glued to the images that are being that are being portrayed online, our attention is being harvested by advertisers is the big issue here. It's the struct like I think of it as a structural issue with the web itself. Because back in the day when you had to go to the adult film store to get a film, you had to walk somewhere, you know, there was friction, it wasn't blasted all over the world. Um, and so a lot of the issues with pornography, I think, are, are more of this encapsulation of more general issues of basically different cultures with different moral ideas, having to share this, this public space and having a lot of disagreements about the way that people ought to live mm -hmm. and a lot of reactions um, to the things that they're having to be exposed to just by the nature of, of the internet as a form itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's, that's like a lot of where I'm coming from in this is mm -hmm. uh, a, a broader kind of perspective about the structure of our digital technology and the ubiquity of advertising. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess that's my perspective. And I do think that it is, it is deeply a moral question. Mm -hmm. There's a moral question about what, what, is the, what rights do we have to basically having an environment where, where we get to be exposed to a, a kind of architecture of experience that doesn't violate our senses and doesn't violate our bodies and doesn't cause us to have stressful reactions. Um, and that's a, that's a much bigger issue than just pornography. Mm. No, really interesting. I mean, just picking up on that point, Jerry, I mean, because I've spoken to other young women and, and they increasingly, the, the younger generation um, research has shown that they're having less sex. And I've spoken to um, other young women who are kind of exhausted by the seeming kind of saturation of pornographic imagery in the public sphere to such an extent where, you know, they feel like there's, you know, they, they feel pressured increasingly to um, do more uh, complicated or, or controversial sex acts because that's seen as increasingly normal. Um, and, and so do, do you not see that that boundaries are sometimes needed to also protect those who aren't necessarily you know wanting to have their sexual freedom expressed in a very um particular way for those who don't maybe want more vanilla expression or something that is not you know the the quintessential porn um porn star so what, what about those who feel saturated by the current environment can you really have sexual freedom when you are constantly kind of dictated to about sexual imagery and it's getting more and more um explicit and more and more um hardcore um i, I think the thing about it getting more explicit isn't necessarily true i think it, 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 to an extent a lot of the rough edges have come off over the years of, as governments have got got their claws back into what was happening on the internet. So I think it was much more a World West kind of place in the 1990s than it, it is now. Um, but things, I mean, it, it's pretty easy to, to click off and not to look at porn if you don't want to. You, you may occasionally have to see something that makes you uncomfortable, but by and large you don't. The, the question you raise is um, pressure to, to live up to, to those kinds of standards. And undoubtedly, that's one of the issues that's come up. You know, undoubtedly, teenage boys are going to see something that excites them and bring it up with their girlfriends um, and try and persuade them to, to get involved in that act. And, you know, the only proper answer to that is that young women need to absolutely more than ever be able to, to say yes and to say no um, and to explain why. And the same goes the other way as well. I mean, actually, we talk about violent porn and rough porn. 
affecting men and, and, and making men's tastes harder and harder. Actually, female tastes in porn tend to go to the more extreme side of, of male taste, and that's that's not something um, that's that's often brought up. But the thing is, this has always been the problem, and the, one of the things I found is that you know, uh, and looking at the figures globally, is that sexual violence has typically plummeted as as internet access has grown and access to pornography correlates very strongly with the decline in sexual violence. So these problems always existed, but we weren't able to talk about them. We didn't have the language. We didn't know who to talk to. Um, and so what the internet has done um, has, uh, one of the things the internet has done has allowed us to, has given us language to talk about what we want to do and, and to, uh, and uh, uh, what we want to do, what we want, don't want to do, and what's happening to us. Um, so, um, yeah, these, these problems have, have always existed. Um, there's nothing wrong with sex becoming less vanilla if that's what people want to do. And a lot of people, you know, doubtless people have more interesting sex lives than they did 30 years ago because a lot of people wouldn't have even thought about these things 30 years ago. Or if they did, they would have been stigmatized and kept quiet about them and thought there's something wrong with them. And by the way, you know, these aren't just heterosexual sex acts. The internet and gay porn um, was, was, for example, one of the, the contributing factors to the destigmatization of homosexuality back in the 90s um, and, and ongoing. And um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, we have to deal with the fact that people might want to try things that they wouldn't have tried before. Mm. And question to you, Megan, before we, we um, open it up to the floor. I mean, you mentioned exploitation and trafficking, but but isn't is it really helpful to kind of conflate um, those some women that are going through that to which I would suspect most people on the panel would agree is wrong and should be you know dealt with versus you know the entirety of of, of the sex industry. I mean, is it is it that you know? Do, do you just think that it is innately, regardless of context, regardless of individual, just something that shouldn't happen? Um, or Because some people might say maybe it's the nature of just sex itself that's innately mysterious. It's innately filled with, you know, excitement, but also trauma. And that's always going to be the case in some way. Um, it probably will always be the case in some way. But I think when we're talking about things like sexual liberation and sexual freedom, particularly for women, I think it's strange to talk about it that in the context of pornography, because I think that for, you know, actual sexual liberation, actual sexual freedom for women, of course, is women having sex for pleasure because they want to. And in pornography, women for the most part are not having sex for pleasure and because they want to. Um, in the sex trade in general and prostitution. They're having sex because they need to, and for the most part, because they have very little choice. And I think we do have to kind of conflate the issues of lack of consent and exploitation and trafficking because those issues are so muddied in the sex trade. You know, there is a lot of pornography. There's a lot of film prostitution. There's films, you know, the girls who are filmed in pornography often are trafficked. Um, or they're traumatized or, you know, messed up in, in a myriad of other ways that don't enable them to truly consent, in my opinion. I mean, if you're making a choice to get paid for sex, you're making a choice not because you want to have sex, but because you need to get paid or because somebody else needs to get paid. Um, and like, I, and I think it's strange to conflate. I think Jerry brought this up earlier. You know, I think that this is all my the arguments that I make and the arguments that some feminists make against the sex trade and against pornography are often talked about in terms of being anti sex or sex negative or wanting to repress sex somehow. But it's not true. I mean, things like casual sex, women being being able to have sex without being judged as like poorish or whatever. You know, that's about women having sex for pleasure and women enjoying sex and women do enjoy sex. And women want to have sex. And I think pornography um, actually sends the opposite me message. You know, pornography in the sex trade treats women as though they don't like sex. Like they just do it because they need to get paid. I don't want to have sex because I need to have sex. I want to have sex because I want. And so, yeah, I mean, 
I'm not sure that that answered your question, <laughs> but I do, I, I, I want to talk about this in terms of ethic and cho choices and morality. Um, and I do want to talk about it in terms of what real sexual freedom and liberation and pleasure looks like. And that's not what's being sold to us in porn. We pretend it is, but really what's being sold is sexual pleasure for men. You know, men use it as a masturbatory tool. And we, we've reached a point where, you know, like I talk to a lot of people in, in my real life and online and in my work about these issues, men in particular, and a lot of men and boys do conflate masturbation with pornography at this point. Like they think that they can't masturbate without pornography. And that if I criticize pornography, I'm criticizing masturbation and it's not true. And I think that's really sad um, and lacking in imagination. But either way, you know, we do have to acknowledge that a lot of what's happening in the sex industry, probably most of what's happening in the sex industry at large is exploitative. Um, and we do end up in these situations where tons and tons and tons of girls have this imagery of themselves out online forever that they can't do anything about that somebody else is making money off of and that somebody is consuming over and over. You know, when we're talking about ethical porn and porn by choice or amateur porn or whatever you want to call it, that's still a minority. Um, there's still so much more out there that really is violent and harmful and and exploitative and abusive and that women really aren't choosing per se and it, it, it sells the message that you know women women don't really need to be enjoying themselves that's not the primary purpose as long as they're getting paid then it's fine and I think that's pretty anti-sex to be honest and just before I put it out to the um floor just two lines from all of the panelists would be really great what 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 does sexual freedom mean to you? What do you understand as sexual freedom? Um, Candice? So again, I would say sexual freedom is everyone being able to make the decision that's best for them and what they define as um, authentic and fulfilling um, and sexual liber sexually liberating. I know, you know, Megan brought up the point that most women in porn don't want to be there and they're exploited. I mean, again, I was in the industry for over a decade. That's not the case. Um, the trafficking numbers also have no relationship to porn. So in a lot of countries like Nepal, for example, we have um, a nonprofit organization that actually runs out of Nepal and it helps women and children that are specifically uh, trafficked in that area. Porn is completely illegal there. And it's also very restricted on the other side of the mountain, which is which is India. So it's not a porn problem. It's just, unfortunately, it's the dark side of humanity problem. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, what's right for you and what's right for me are probably going to be different things based of, off of our needs, our needs for significance, our needs for um, community, our needs for connection, all of those things. And I think sexual freedom is me being able to make the choices that are best for me and you being able to make those choices that are best for you and not throwing rocks at each other because of morality. Because, I mean, there's that that joke where it's like being a cannibal is only wrong if you don't eat people, right? So morality skews across cultures and countries. And most of the, the ones that we so fundamentally feel are just based off of where we grew up and the people that you know surrounded us during that very impressionable time of our lives so um yeah i think it's the choice to be who you are thank you and uh jerry um yeah i think it's um it's about autonomy it's the freedom to do or not to do it's the freedom to watch or not to watch and it's also the freedom not to be judged and actually i've known so many women in particular in the industry, in from the porn industry, or fit friends with sex workers. And in every case, you ask them what's the worst thing that's happened to them in their lives. And it's the stigmatization, by often by campaigners that claim they want to rescue them. It's the screaming, it's being screamed at by protesters outside their strip clubs. It's being called a slut on, on social media. Um, it's, and it, it's far worse for sex workers and, and porn stars when they have families and when they have children because suddenly they, they, um, their kids become affected and, and parents shun, shun them and all this kind of thing. So it's, yes, it's, it's freedom not to be judged. And just picking up um, on, on the, the issue, like we hear all the time about exploitation, trafficking, and so little evidence provided, as, as Candice just said, 
Um, and, you know, I, I spent a long time just trying to find out where it was. But in the end, I wrote a letter to Object, which is one of the, the anti-porn feminist groups in the UK. And I said to him, look, every time I, I meet you in university debates, you say you've spoken to this woman, you've heard this story, and, and, and you've heard all these terrible stories about things happening to women in the porn industry. Why don't we go to the local police station together, bring these stories, let's go to the police, I will help you hunt down the people in the industry responsible for this. And of course, they, they never applied. So it's very hard to actually find these cases. And of course, there are cases of exploitation and trafficking, it doubtless exists. But on the scale that it's claimed by the anti-porn and anti-prostitution campaigns, it's very hard to find it. Thank you, okay. Um, Raven? What does sexual freedom mean in your view? Yeah, um, well, I mean, it, it feels very um, contextual uh, in terms of like the way that we kind of uh, think about morality within our legal system. Uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of punishment, the kind of crime and punishment method, the, 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 the creation of a kind of uh, bureaucracy that happened with industrialization and the kind of enclosure of human behavior, basically start like people who are engaging in homo, like homosexual acts, you know, like, there, like Alan Turing had, was castrated by the British government, right? Like there was all of these kinds of extremely horrific things that happened to people who were um, engaging in perverse sexual acts during this kind of like wave of industrialization and the increased power of the state. So I think we're, we are dealing with an issue of basically state intervention into people's personal lives. Um, whereas more traditional societies, there just really wasn't as much surveillance on people's day to day lives and lots of people discovered how to have anal sex um, in human history without having to watch porn. Um, and people were doing all sorts of things uh, and, and because people are people, right? And you know, now the situation is we're apes with cameras and we're spreading images of ourselves um, having uh, sexual experiences all over the internet um, and that gets us attention and uh, it makes us feel uh, you know, aroused and kind of engaged in these sexual acts. And so, I mean, I think we're talking about a particular kind of of government of a kind uh, that now is even more of a surveillance state. So the issue of sexual freedom is also connected to just how much influence and how much power the state actually has over our day to day lives. Uh, and so sexual freedom, I think, is is in a way a way of protecting individuals from uh, re repercussions from the state um, and and basically being um, accused of doing criminal acts, actually cr criminal acts. And I think that's a very particular context to be in because the question of how we wanna live our lives uh, is different. That's mm -hmm. a different question, right? There's lots of different ways for somebody to self-author uh, and to decide how they wanna have sex, how they wanna engage with other people, whether or not intimacy and sensitivity and openness and that sense of belonging and interconnection is the more important thing for them or if they're interested in kind of going down a path of shock and fetishization in their sexual lives. And these are actually very polar opposite things, right? If, if, if from a sensory perspective, from a body perspective, the experience of like making oneself open and vulnerable is like, is if you are gonna get hurt in that experience, that's gonna be traumatizing for you. But I think that's all kind of inside of the bubble um, of sexual freedom. Like we're protected to kind of have those conversations and questions by this like buffer that allows for many different kinds of, of ways of being to be expressed and explored within within the context of our society. So I think the question, the legal question um, and the kind of status of sexual freedom within the perspective of like literally the judicial system and what things we have the right to do and what things uh, we can be criminal liable for is one thing, but the way of living our lives is a totally different question. Um, and I don't even, I don't even, per, just personally, I don't think of my sexual life as being related to sexual freedom conceptually. So I think that those are kind of different issues. And I think that's where the morality question comes in. We, mm -hmm. we are confronted with this question of how do we want to live our lives and how do we live along with people who have completely different ideas about what a good life is when we're all having to crowd in the same environments and compete over the same kinds of territories, mm -hmm. you know, 
So that's, I guess that's my perspective on it. Um, I think it is really contingent on our government and our legal system that we even frame the question in this way. Thank you, Raven. Really interesting. And and Megan, just quickly, what 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 does sexual freedom mean to you? What do, what do you think about it? And then I'm going to open it up to the floor. So please put your um, digital hands up, and then you'll be picked. Um, I mean, I think that I talked about it a little bit before, but I think that it's about. I do think it's about autonomy, and I do think it's about making whatever choices are right for us, and also feeling empowered to say no or yes to whatever makes sense for us in our own lives and to whatever we want. Um, and I mean, it's hard to talk about sexual freedom in this context because girls are growing up in this pornified world where they're learning that what sex is, is what they're seeing essentially in pornography. And again, I'm not necessarily, I'm talking partly about literal pornography, but I'm also talking about the pornographic images and the pornographic content that are all over social media, that are all over Instagram, that are all over Twitter, that are in advertising, that are in the media, um, and learning that this is what it looks like to be a sexual being. And what you look like has nothing to do with sexual pleasure. What you wear has nothing to do with sexual pleasure. What you perform has nothing to do with sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure has to do with you and your body and this intimate experience. It's not a, a public show. Um, that's something totally different in my opinion, but they're learning that sexuality is being looked at, is being objectified, is doing this performance that looks like what they see and what their boyfriends see and what the boys they're engaging with online are seeing online. And I think that's sort of the opposite of sexual freedom, although um, I don't know how we prevent that from happening. I mean, I would suggest more conversations and better education, but you know, at the end of the day, it's about pleasure. It's not about having sex because you need the money. It's not about having sex because you want attention, because you want validation. It should be about true, genuine pleasure and, you know, mutual respect between partners um, if you're having sex with another person, you know. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it up to the floor. Please put your digital hand up. And we're going to take a few questions at a time because we are already, you know, running out of time. It's been a really interesting conversation already. So we'll take kind of four questions at a time and then please panelists kind of short, sharp answers so we can keep getting through um, the audience. So um, we'll take uh, Nancy McDermott, then Nastasia, then Dylan. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering if something has changed because um, it seems to me that pornography was always kind of uh, was kind of there, but at least you know when I was coming of age, it paled into insignificance compared to discovering sex with a real person. Um, and uh, and and so I I'm I'm I wonder if you think what you think about that and just. That something that keeps coming up in the discussion is about sex being core to the self. Um, and I think that's kind of unique to our society. I also think the degree to which this people think of this is, is, uh, as being true may have increased. Um, if you look at sex education now, it's all sex is great, sex is healthy, sex might as well be kale. It's become almost like an entitlement. Um, and very narcissistic because it's all about me and my needs and not so much um, about, uh, about uh, giving to another person and having them give to you. Um, so I just wondered if, um, if I, they have any thoughts about that. Thank you. Let's see then. Nastasia, then Dylan. Hi. Um, thanks to everyone. Really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, I guess just want to talk about um, like the government role in kind of censoring um, pornography, et cetera, and how it links to free speech. Um, I definitely see kind of the argument which I think they employ about you know positive socialization of children and having to kind of like censor certain things on on the internet. Um, and that is, I guess, rightly or wrongly, the burden that um, that they've chosen um, um, to bear. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you can definitely see kind of the impact of, of that decision. Um, you know, the online harms bill in the UK um, that's coming and also Tumblr private company removed um, all pornography. Um, 
and yeah like within tumblr removing all pornography from their website um you know there was um certain content on there that was you know violent um but also there's non-violent content that's that's no longer um allowed there so i guess i yeah my concern would be kind of the slippery slope of a government deciding that they should remove these things is that they can then remove other things that they deem um to be harmful but um, my question, as we were discussing, um, was whether we should actually, you know, be concerned about censorship of uh, pornography specifically and whether it actually limits sexual freedom. Um, a lot of male friends I have are sort of deciding not to watch pornography, you know, often and like taking that upon themselves. And I guess the question to the panellists is, do you think that that move is actually linked to the government action of deciding to remove, you know, pornographic material from the internet or if it is a Sort of natural pushback that's occurred without without that influence. Thanks, and Dylan. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you guys for coming. It's uh, really a privilege to have you guys have this earnest conversation here with like so much good faith. Um, my question, I guess, is more of a comment for for all of your observation, and that's that. Uh, you know, we've been touching upon this idea that that porn and 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 prostitution and sex work in general is linked to a broader social issue of like fetishization and fantasy and consumer culture in general. And I am wondering if you know when we talk about something like pornography specifically, is it so, you know, my take is that it might have a negative effect on young people in society in general. And I think the statistics point to the fact that most people, well, the, st the statistics seem to suggest that most people think porn is not very good. Like, it's fun, and a lot of us like it, but it might not be very good for us. So, I guess my question is, is the conversation really, should that really be about censoring or limiting certain kinds of porn, which were certain kinds of implementation and things like that, which I think was mentioned earlier, or should we be in fact trying to inculcate better values that might encourage people to make different choices? Like instead of trying to prune or control things, it seems like it might be better to offer a different cultural lens than one of consumerism by which young people can make decisions and have that informed consent that we're talking about. Mm. No, interesting that this seems to keep you know, coming up. Is it, you know, it, is it about, you know, what kind of values and principles we should be teaching in order to, you know, deal with these questions versus, you know, or, or whether or not it's harmful, this or that. Um, okay, so just pick up points from the panel so we can get back into the audience who several people have questions. So does anyone just pick up on anything? Um, feel free to uh, jump in. Raven, is there anything you wanna pick up on? I just saw Jerry unmuted, so I'll let him go if he wants to speak. <laughs> um, okay, thanks. Um, uh, the second one, Nastasia, um, talking about the government role um, in, in censorship and, and in controlling what we see this is one of the aspects that's most worried me and especially because i was involved in the porn industry that uh, until about 2012 and so and i came into contact very more and more with the british state and the british government and their plans for censorship and i began to realize that i didn't like the kind of people who were involved in deciding in, in the censorship in in what they call media regulators which which is a euphemism for censors I became very uneasy dealing with these people and realized that a hell of a lot of this is about power. Um, and ultimately, I, I realized you can't really introduce censorship of one thing without creating a general censorship mechanism that can very easily be switched on, switched on, switched on. And indeed, every time there's been government actions to censor something on the internet, they usually lead with porn, terrorism, or uh, uh, yeah, or, you know, harm to children, one of those things. And the minute that there's general agreement that a censorship mechanism is needed, then they suddenly throw in another dozen things that they also think need censoring. So I become kind of more of a, a free speech absolutist than I used to be. And certainly 
um, you know, for a Brit, you know, Americans have more of a concept of free speech than, than we do. Um, the other reason why I don't think the state should get involved in, in censoring porn is because there are a lot, porn has changed society and it continues to change society. And that it changes society in both positive and negative ways. And by, by simply stamping on it, because you don't like the negative changes, you also get rid of the positive changes and which probably outweigh the negative changes in, in my opinion. Feel free, does anyone from the panel want to pick up? Um, yeah, I would just pick up really just from what Jerry said. I think that this is a really important point that the government itself is also using the same techniques um, to shock people and try and get their attention using pornography, uh, using the exploitation of children. Like this is a rhetorical problem in our society because of the intensity of which we're having to attract and basically capture people's uh, attention. And morality is often used as a way of capturing people's attention. Uh, and basically freaking them out and getting them invested in, in, in certain kinds of political projects. And, and so I think that like the criticism of, of pornography as you know, kind of corrupting or basically you know, hijacking people's attention using shock value, the government itself is using these same exact tools in order to compete with advertising and other forms of attention harvesting that exist within our society. Um, I do, I also would it say that I agree that um, basically a free and open algorithm, a, a, um, a, a strong stance against censorship is extremely important within this political regime, because can we really trust the people who are the ones controlling the leverages of, of regulation in our society? Do we feel that sense of trust with our government? I think you can make very strong arguments that our best interests as a public are not being served. You know, I'm from the United States, so that's my particular political context. So it's maybe not an issue of the kind of fundamental um, status of censorship or the fundamental status of pornography, but rather the historical context we happen to be in and the regime that we happen to be living under and whether or not we want to invite greater surveillance and greater censorship as part of our political projects. Um, I would also like to respond to um, the, first, the first woman who spoke, Nancy. Um, you know, I think what you're talking about is a broader social critique, uh, which is basically like, what are the values? Dylan also spoke to this as well. What are the values in society that we're holding up? You know, I think personally, if we're thinking outside of just the political context or the pornographic context, we as a society are facing moral questions that our ancestors just never had to confront. We have to confront so many different kinds of ways of living, all these people sharing the same spaces. We have to live with 8 billion people on the planet that has never been a situation before. Our actual context and the moral quandaries that we're having to, to deal with are, are not consistent with human history. And so actually this is a philosophical and a moral question that goes beyond legislation. And I think that you know if we wanna have that conversation that's actually outside of the context of whether or not this is about censorship or not, this is about ways of living. Um, and I don't think that this will be the same in every single place. I think that everyone will, this, there will be a kind of, um, uh, you know, postmodern or kind of polycentric or kind of like many interpretations and many ways of people clumping together around certain ways of life that we may see coming into the future. And that actually the ability and the protection of those things to emerge and arise organically is necessary. And so if the government is actually pretend, like protecting and nudging certain things, um, I think that that's something to be concerned about as a political project. But the question of whether or not pornography is like a way of, of socializing oneself as a sexual being, uh, whether or not it creates healthy sexual environments is a separate issue that I think Nancy and Dylan were both touching on as being greater value oriented problems and community oriented questions. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I would, oh, sorry, am I interrupting? And I go for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would agree that it's for me, I'm more interested in the moral and ethical implications of <clears throat> producing and consuming pornography over the government censorship question, because I don't trust the government to determine what should or should not be allowed on the internet or be allowed to be produced. I mean, again, I do think that the government should enforce the law. So I tend to be confused as to why, you know, in places where paying for sex or profiting from women selling sex. So, you know, things like brothel owning. And I, I think those kinds of laws obviously could and should be applied to pornography. You know, I don't want 
men making a bunch of money off the sexual exploitation of women, period. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think, I, I know that a lot of boys and men are making the individual choice not to consume porn, mostly for their own well-being. Um, I think a lot of us know that pornography is super misogynistic and super degrading to women and super unethical. And then, you know, people make the choice to use it or not use it anyway. But to pretend as though we don't see that, I think, is dishonest. And so I think a lot of people will think about the impact of consuming this imagery on their brains, on their sexualities, again, on their relationships in terms of how they relate to women and girls. You know, it's just this constant barrage of these hugely, highly sexualized graphic images. I think, you know, it feels like eating junk food. Like, I don't think it really feels good. And I think it would be hard to argue that consuming pornography, um, especially in large amounts, is good for us. I think we know better. And so, so no, I don't think that people are making the choice not to use pornography because of government and intervention or censorship. I think they're making the choice because they know that it has a really negative psychological impact on them and it has a negative impact on their sexualities and sex lives. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, like I think when we're talking about profit and we're talking about these huge companies and corporations that are making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of this this imagery off of women and girls off of degrading women and girls um i think that you know we could argue that there could be government interventions and and laws that make it more difficult to profit from from sexual exploitation okay thank you so we've got um everyone that wants to speak please put your hand up now because we're just going to go through all of the um audience and then we'll just have closing um state one minute kind of statements each from the panelists so please if you want to speak um put your hand up now but it is interesting there seems to be some synthesis developing like a broad agreement that maybe you know censorship or government intervention isn't the right way but there is seems to be uh, still a kind of tension between um a cent centralizing of kind of freedom and bodily autonomy um, versus a kind of question of what kind of life do we want to inculcate into young people? So maybe that is part of, you know, going forward about getting used to, or as a society being able to talk in moral terms um, and, and what in, in that bigger sense of what kind of society do we want to create and being able to negotiate in that terms. But yeah, so for the, for the last kind of 10 minutes or so, please, as I said, if you want to speak, please put your hand up now. Um, so, Omer? Are you there? Okay, I don't know where Omer is. So we'll go to um, Hal's, Hal, Hal's iPhone. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, my question is uh, just really as people who are concerned about free speech, how much should... Uh, how much should we foreground pornography in such issues? Because I personally, I guess, think that it's kind of almost at the tip of the spear. It's something that you have to defend if you're uh, if you support free speech or uh, free expression. Because just basically banning any sort of expression is sort of a slippery slope, in my view. But how would you uh, deal with the situation? Because obviously. I know in the U.S. right now, we have a situation where there are a lot of activists who are very rightly concerned about like really uh, kind of grotesque forms of even like grooming related uh, children's books and libraries. And these are kind of being used to attack uh, schools. Uh, and that's kind of a right wing thing, but it is uh, a bit understandable. So obviously, I don't think those books should be censored. But at the same time, like how much is it useful to really make this the main um, the major free speech issue and like bring it into the foreground or is it something that should be defended when it comes up but it shouldn't be like foregrounded as like a way of like deliberately transgressing or provoking people mm, that's really interesting um luke hi thanks anaya uh, Jerry, I just want to pick up on something quickly you said before. You said that um, increasing internet access is correlated with um, decreases in sexual violence. 
I shouldn't need to say this, I just want to point out that correlation isn't always causation. Like internet access is a key uh, social variable for all sorts of other things. So if you've got research actually linking um, increasing internet access specifically to decreasing sexual violence, I'd love to see it. Um, just want to put that out there because you did call out Megan before for, for lacking in uh, or being oblivious to research, I think you said, but I'd like to, to see that research if you, if you have it. Um, as a general point, it seems to me that porn has a lot to answer for. Um, it, it's clear to me that it affects the individual negatively. It affects our brain. It encourages negative patterns of behavior. It's addictive. It affects our, our brains like a, like a drug. Um, it obviously affects our relationships. Like what, in, in my view, what we should be looking towards to have children and succeed in society is to have monogamous relationships. And it's clear to me that porn doesn't fit well into a, into a monogamous relationship. It's not he healthy for, for intimacy um, or sex. And it normals the objectification of women. I take this from someone from like me who used to watch a lot of porn and doesn't anymore. And has seen, obviously this is purely anecdotal, but has seen a genuine difference in the way I interact with women, the way I see women um, in my daily life. And and porn clearly, as, as we've talked about as well tonight, affects society negatively. Um, the, the links are there between porn and sex trafficking and sexual violence and, and non-conceptual sex. And we can we, you can disagree with all that research and actually say, well, you know, let's neutralize that out. And here's some here's some research that that um, that disproves all of that. But I'd like to hear from anyone in the panel if actually there's any arguments that are positive that are actually saying porn is helpful to society, porn is productive, porn is 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 positive in any way. Because at the moment, all I've heard is that actually porn's made our sex lives more interesting. Um, and I'm I'm really not sure that you know getting Pornhub on in in the evening is is going to actually help our help our sex lives in the long run. That that seems to me to be a silly argument. But again, I'd like to hear the re see the research if if it is there. Thank thank you. I will say I think Jerry did make the point earlier that he thought that you know for people gay people and, and trans people like you know, that 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 for some of them that was the first time they were able to see um, people that had. A similar sexual orientation to them so that could be argued to be a positive thing um tony wilkinson i want to go back to uh since i'm the 79 year old guy who went to college in 1960 and i did actually go through that period a comment like nancy said yes things have changed because that was the time the pill had just come out also and I'm a naturist. So back then, uh, and there were a lot of families, kids involved in naturism too. And I can tell you from personal experience and some of the smaller anecdotal studies that were done academically, that the kids of naturist families grew up very well balanced. They didn't go off crazy. They've seen body parts all their lives. It's normal that the, it basically normalized the, the human body and uh, back then, the so-called porn was like full frontal. Uh, it was sexually interesting. You could see people's body parts. It's not like explicit sex, but people really did have a personal approach to the sex act. It meant something. And things have changed. And I think uh, we're talking about porn very broadly, but I really do think that there's a quantum difference in terms of effect on kids between voluntary nude images and commercial heavy duty porn. And I've spent all my time in the chat attacking commercial heavy duty porn. But I do want to say for my last comment for Jerry, uh, you know, nude, naturists and nudists are folks who are innocent people who just are not textiles. It's, it's you know, fairly harmless. There are very few people, but lots of, of kids skinny dip at, and on spring break, but but they don't do be a card carrying nudist. But we in the naturist community know that uh, porn is actually the the canary in the coal mine for censorship. I think Jerry just made that point that it is the it is a symbol that all these other things Wait, that people Penny, want to censor Penny, are going to come after it. I'm Thank done. I'm, that was my point. 
Thank you. So got, we only have a few minutes left. So please, very, very, very short um, questions. And we won't be taking any more questions um, after the, the next five. So just a sentence, please, for everyone. Um, question any Shankar. Um, yeah, hi, sorry, I'll try and make this brief. So this is more of a question regarding Jerry's previous point regarding lonely single men and porn consumption. Do you think this is something that's cause and effect? Is porn causing men not to seek physical intimacy or is it filling a void or is it somewhere in between? And, you know, if it's more on the filling a void side of things, what do you think is driving this, driving this sort of singleness and loneliness amongst young men? Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, probably mostly Megan, about you focused a lot on the mor morality of um, porn, but I wanted to look a lot more about the economic side of porn and how that should the government really, instead of legislation against porn, which isn't really going to benefit women who actually find this like one only economic option, like surely they should be trying to change the economic structure and the ways in which um, people in lower classes can actually get a better income and that would not only stop this kind of censorship against sexual liberation but also allow them to have more choice in what they do in their everyday lives instead of being essentially economically coerced into it and that that's a better strategy than legalizing or taking laws against it which hasn't really worked in the past. Thanks Anna. Um... Ewan, did you want to ask a question? It seems like your hand's down. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, I would still like to ask you, actually. Um, I was wondering if any of the panelists would acknowledge or agree with the fact that there is a big general generational issue that is um, going to become more important, um, particularly with Gen Z, with their growing up um, and having so much of their sexual education um, and so much of their culture on the internet being consumed by pornography. Um, and if you would agree that there would be damages um, uh, stemming from that. Thank you. And, and finally, Sophie. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that I don't think anyone on the panel has sort of even attempted to answer the question of whether porn actually is a free speech issue or an issue of freedom when we're talking about an industry. Um, Jeremy's, arg sorry, Jerry's argument so far in favour of not regulating porn or not censoring porn, however you want to put it, is to say that porn isn't harmful, which seems to imply that it doesn't fulfil the harm principle that J.S. Mill obviously established. And, you know, that's why we shouldn't curtail it. Um, but we haven't established that porn is speech in fact it clearly isn't speech it doesn't convey any idea or content or sort of have any meaning or value or meaning in its content um so how is it that sexual freedom which on the surface of it would just seem to mean that individuals should be able to have whatever sex they want how does that become a question about um letting people make money out of people having the sex that they want if that makes sense Good last question to um, end on. So could we just have um, roundup thoughts? It'd be good to pick up on some of the things, particularly what Sophie said, Jerry, um, when we do our uh, last closing thoughts. So um, we'll, I'll go to you first, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's start with Sophie. I mean, the question is of whether porn is speech is kind of is very much a, a semantic one but you know the key thing is what's what does free speech mean in terms of free expression and in the, the, the US Supreme Court decided I believe in 1969 that port specifically porn does constitute speech from the point of view of the First Amendment so at least in free speech terms porn does porn is expression and it and it's considered speech so um yeah, so, so it is protected under the First Amendment, and it has been since the, the, the Supreme Court decided that. You mentioned the harm principle, and that's very key. The onus is on people claiming harm to prove the harm, and so far they've failed to do that over the past 50 years or so. Um, briefly, getting back to how should, uh, he asked how much should we foreground pornography and, talk, uh, and mentioned, talked about pornography as the tip of the spear, and I very much agree that's 
why I've really focused on it, both from the point of view that I, I think porn and sexual freedom are broadly beneficial things, but also because it's the tip of the sphere, the, the spear or the canary in the coal mine. Um, and so absolutely we should focus on the things that are hardest to defend. Um, you know, it's easy to defend political speech on principle. It's not easy to defend pornography. And that's what I do. Um, I think just wanted to get back to Luke was the, um, the kind of key one. He, he asked about, I, I talked about correlations with decreases in sexual violence and absolutely, yeah, correlation is not causation. It's very hard to prove causation, but there are some really good studies. Um, and don't forget, this has been a mass experiment that has been carried out on the global population and in particular on the US population and in Western Europe for over 50 years now. So we have an incredible amount of correlational data. And what we find it, I mean, we find some fairly stunning results. These aren't just marginal results. Um, and I could, uh, um, I mentioned, I've written my book, Porn Panic, which has a chapter on this. And I took, and I sell the chapter separately as an ebook called Porn, What's the Harm? But in essence, you have stunning changes like from between, I think, 1979 and 2006, I believe there was an 85 percent decline in recorded sexual violence in the United States. And of course, we should question these figures, but we should remember at the same time that actually the recording of sexual violence didn't decrease, it actually increased. So even while poor sexual violence was more likely to increase, but to be recorded, there was a stunning decline, 85%. And I think more people should be aware of this. It's, it's an absolutely seismic change. And we saw the same again in West Germany, in Denmark, the first place to legalize porn. We saw the same in, the, in Czechoslovakia after communism fell and all censorship laws were taken away. So we have, there's a hell of a lot of evidence correlating um, rising porn consumption to a decline in sexual violence. Um, and yeah, I don't really have time to go into, into yeah. all of that. Um, okay, I'll leave it there and let someone else answer some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Or well, if you want to know more of Jerry's thoughts, you can buy his book. Um, I'm sure he'll elaborate in his perspective in there. Um, Candice, this closing thoughts. Um, so I guess to touch on the positive, like the benefits of porn, and I'm, obviously I don't have hardcore data in front of me, but um, the book A Billion Wicked Thoughts is an awesome one. It actually talks about 9-11 and the first responders that had shown up to rescue people from the towers. So a lot of them were experiencing a lot of PTSD and what they were finding specifically with the firefighters um, is that they were going to these BDSM, uh, I guess you'd call them like clubs or dungeons or what have you. And they were hiring dominatrix to work out their, um, their traumas through BDSM. And when it comes to how our brains are wired, when it comes to sexuality and pain, like they are so close, like they're almost um, overlapping. So it's a very easy way to reframe trauma into a positive experience in order to ex like in, in order to fully, I guess, experience that trauma and release it instead of holding on to it and then having all of these ailments from it. Um, Dr. Nicole Prouse is actually doing a lot of work too on the benefits of pornography. So she works with MAPS, which is doing a lot of work in the psychedelic space up in Canada. And what they're finding is through um, masturbation, sex, and even through watching porn, like there's no difference. You can achieve the same benefits regardless of like the medium that you're using is again, you can help with anxiety, depression, um, feeling overwhelmed. You can have moments of transcendence, which have often only been linked to psychedelics. So people that maybe aren't able to um, do a psilocybin journey because of addiction issues, or there's a lot of fear around that, they can do something that's a lot less invasive and um, experience those benefits through through sex, masturbation, and pornography. Also, Esther Perel does a lot of work when it comes to pornography and when it comes to like this jealousy that comes into it and this idea that it's not healthy for a relationship. It can't be used to spice up your relationship. It can't be used as a form of erotica. It can't be healthy. That's kind of strictly a heterosexual issue. So when she works with all of these gay couples, it's not even on the table. Um, so to pretend that it's just, it's it's bad for everybody and it's the cause of divorce and it's the cause of mistreating women, it's simply not the case. And when they've looked at studies, often these men that are um, showcasing these misogynistic behaviors 
were already had those tendencies. They had these atypical behaviors. Um, so it, yeah, you can't, you, it's really hard to say this is the cause and this is the effect. You can find the relationship there, but most of the studies have suggested that that behavior was there prior to porn. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, it's really easy to point your finger and say that it's it's inherently bad and there's no there's no benefit and it's it's just wreaking havoc on society. But if we start to police everything that has a potential negative consequence, then we're going to be censoring everything. We're going to be putting guardrails on everything. So you have to look at the negative impacts of tobacco, of alcohol, of divorce, right? Like these things, I don't think anyone could argue have a bigger negative impact societally than watching porn, right? So most of us can have a couple drinks. Most of us can watch a couple of videos and it's not going to be a problem. And then there's a small percentage of people that don't have that accountability or that self-regulation and it becomes a problem. So I think when we we narrate this thing because of that small percentage, it's very dishonest. Thank you, Candace Raven, for your closing thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> um Closing thoughts. Yeah, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, I think we've we've touched on a lot of almost like the failure of our ability to even make sure determinations of of, of pornography, the status of pornography in our lives. Um, I think that just to go back to to Hal's point and kind of I think also what Candace is saying in terms of like, you know, is is pornography really the biggest issue in our society? Is that really the thing that's the crux of the problem? Uh, what Hal is pointing out is the grooming of children, uh, basically, and how accessible children are not only by, you know, print books and education and socialization programs, uh, but also by basically being online um, and being open as uh, users, online users to adults who have, um, you know, have interests in, in child and in, in child development and the way that a child particularly develops. Um, that are not in the best interest of that child. So, I mean, I think, and, and you know, I'm kind of a web three person. I don't know, uh, it, it, in terms of like thinking about the internet and its structure itself, I, I think is actually a really important thing that's often not centered in this conversation. It like literally the structure of the internet, the advertising model, uh, the attention economy, um, how everything is, uh, is mediated by transaction, um, that, that this type of structure is actually producing an environment that makes human beings extremely vulnerable and very much extracted and targeted uh, for their, their weaknesses uh, because of basically our, our evolutionary proclivities. You know, it, it's, it's textbook how to hijack a person um, and to capture their attention and the amount of misinformation and the amount of targeted misinformation that we're seeing in the United States and I'm sure in other countries as well is, is exponential, it's exponentially growing. Uh, so I think porn is an example of, of an attention economy. Uh, I think it is vulgar, which is part of why people are so disgusted by it and why there's such a strong moral reaction. Just the explicitness of it and, and the vulgarity of it kind of causes a, a moral reaction that other types of things are a little bit more withdrawn, but we are seeing the effects of them. We're seeing the effects of people being targeted by um, you know, mills, of, of, of people producing bots and turning people into conspiracy theorists, making them really paranoid. So like in terms of thinking about pornography and the internet, I mean, I think they're, I think they're def, def, definitely linked. Um, and Jerry has pointed this out that like porn on the internet, it really shifted our, our interactions with pornography. Um, and so the structure of the internet itself, the way that our, our transactions are working, uh, I think Emma also pr pr um, brought up economics, which I think is huge. Uh, I think of the increasing amount of women coming in, going into pornography and prostitution as being a sign of economic decay. Um, so, but these women are in a situation where the ceiling, the potential income that they can make doing pornography or prostitution is much higher than the things that they would be able to do um, for a $15 minimum wage, right? So people are in a very tight economic situation. And um, I think that that's another very important thing to be thinking about in terms of where are we, are we seeing this as a good thing that more women are going into porn? Maybe not. Uh, does that mean we should target porn itself and, and target women who are engaging in prostitution themselves? Or should we be looking at larger structural economic issues? Um, I think that's a really important frame and I really appreciate that Emma brought that up. So I think those are just some ideas. 
Um, obviously, we could continue having a much longer conversation about this. Um, but yes, thank you all so much for your attention and your amazing questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Raven. And finally, Megan, your closing thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think I want to respond to what Candace brought up in terms of the question of porn and relationships and the way that people like Astrid Perel talk about that in, in terms of jealousy, um, as though women shouldn't have any feelings about their partner paying other women for sex or engaging in sex acts with other women. I mean, I, I thought that I had addressed the issue of whether or not porn is free speech early on, um, but maybe I didn't. I, but, you know, I don't think porn is speech. I think porn is film prostitution. And women are disturbed when their partners in their relationship are consuming porn because they're engaging in sex acts with other women and paying other women for sex acts, essentially. And because they're disturbed at what their partners are watching. You know, if my partner is watching something that's degrading to women and that's misogynist, then yeah, I'm going to be upset about that. And to kind of frame that as a as just jealousy, like, I mean, would you would you dismiss a woman if she was concerned because her partner was going to strip clubs and getting lap dances or if he was paying women in prostitution for sex of course you would and of course you are going to be concerned if your partner's consuming um this kind of sexual content that's having an impact on your relationship which happens a lot you know men will say i want to try this i want to do this i want to have anal sex you know they're seeing things in pornography that they want to try on their partners and very often women are those aren't things that women enjoy you know pornography for the most part is geared towards men it isn't geared towards women so these are going to be things that men want to do and that often women aren't going to want to do because they're painful or they just don't feel good or yeah they feel degraded by that situation and so i guess i feel frustrated when we tell women that they should, you know, just put those concerns aside or that they shouldn't, you know, if you do feel inherent disgust at pornography, I think there's a totally valid and good reason for that. And I don't think you should try to quash that. And I think that men who are in relationships with women who are upset by their porn user concern should treat their partner with respect and care about how their partner feels in a relationship and in terms of like how they feel about their sex life and what they're consuming and how that impacts their sex lives. I mean, it's like, just because it, like a man watches porn, women are supposed to accept that and be okay with it and pretend that it doesn't matter and that that man is entitled to do that. I think that's a horrible approach to relationships. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the free speech issue, I don't, again, I don't think that it's speech. I think that it would be more accurate to call it film prostitution, in which case a solution I think could be an application of prostitution laws to pornography. So I advocate the Nordic model, which criminalizes men who exploit women in prostitution. So it criminalizes brothel owners, pimps, traffickers. So I don't think that, again, men should be able to make money off of prostituting women. And I think that we can and should target the porn industry in the same way. But also I think that we should be thinking about respect for our partners and respect for women in general and respect for ourselves and our own lives and how the consumption of porn is impacting our brains and men's ability to get erections and men's ability to like have respectful, intimate sex with their partners and for their partners to feel respected. Like God, men should care if their partners feel respected in a relationship and porn use doesn't necessarily uh, convey that. Thank you, Megan. Well, this has been a huge discussion. And I think in you know, some senses we've ended where we started off, which is, you know, sex and porn and all of these things are complicated and messy and loads of people have very strong and differing views about it. And, and it is going to be a challenging territory to work um, our way through it. And there's even discussion still whether or not it is, does constitute speech and whether or not from a free speech advocacy perspective it is something that we should at least defend in principle or argue against censorship or whether or not that's just a totally different domain and has nothing to do with free speech so i lots of interesting arguments lots of interesting perspectives i just want to thank the amazing panel really really interesting um commentary and ideas and insights um, and I'm sure the, I speak for everyone as well in the audience to say that it was uh, very enriching and, and hugely you know, uh, 
exciting to hear all of these different things. And thank you so much to the audience for coming and putting forward all of these great questions and listening. And I think it was a good example of really good dialogue across different um, perspectives. So thank you so much, um, everyone, for attending. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening where you are in the world. And um, we will, and yeah, feel free to, to enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll, I will leave this um, Zoom chat open because sometimes people continue to chat, um, commenting on the rest of the, the, the conversation. So thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.